Hello everyone and welcome to my talk about why software testing is a waste of time. So first, let me quickly introduce myself. So my name is Francois Martin and I'm a full stack software engineer at Caracoon. Uh, by the way, just to um, do some advertisement, Caracoon has offices in Dortmund um, and also in Basel in Switzerland. So, uh, and we are also hiring, so if you're interested, then feel free to uh, let us know. Um, and also, I am a lecturer, part-time, 20%. I'm teaching students on how they learn Java. And also, I'm an active member at the Swiss Testing Board. And you can find how to reach me on the left. So, who um, those of you who don't know what the Swiss Testing Board is, it's a member board of the ISTQB. Maybe you know the German Testing Board. It's something similar to that, so they offer certifications in software testing. And also, by the way, maybe you noticed there is a QR code in the top right. It will be in every slide. Um, so I in case you're curious about the slides and want to download them, you can simply scan the QR code and then you can get the slides this way. So now that you know something about me, I'd also like to know something about you. So who of you works in QA? Raise your hand. Okay, so some of you, like three or five, four or five hands. Let's see, who of you is uh, working in de software development? Okay, most of you, so that's good. Um, so then, um, after I wrote down what I wanted to cover in this talk, I was kind of curious what ChatGPT has to say about it, or what ChatGPT thinks that I should cover, maybe. So I thought I would ask ChatGPT what uh, he or she <laughs> thought about this. And you can see here the question that they asked. And I have to say, I'm not sure if you've read the answer yet, but as soon as I saw the answer, I was kind of glad that ChatGPT wasn't member of the JCon content board. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so let's have a look. The thing is, question is, is software testing a waste of time in general? So let's see at first, who of you thinks this is the case? Okay, nobody. So maybe um, you were just ca you just came here to my talk to prove me wrong. Let's see, maybe. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, but um, maybe also I could ask you, who of you would feel comfortable turning off testing in their CI pipeline? Okay, also nobody. That's a good sign. So that means that it is effective and it's doing its job at least. So that's a good news. So let's look at the point again. Is it a waste of time in general? So actually there is empirical data that proves this to be not the case. There is data that proves that um, improved software quality results in a better return on investment and in a lower total cost of ownership. You will see a source here. By the way, every time you see something that is underlined, this is a link you can click as soon as you download the slides to learn more about certain things. So. Uh, generally, this kind of means that not testing software is more expensive than testing software, which kind of sounds strange when you hear it first, <laughs> but that's the way it is. So, um, of course, there are things that are done in software testing that are a waste of time, which this talk is about. So my goal of this talk, by the way, is that you learn just at least one new thing that you can use in your day-to-day -day practice. Um, that you can waste less time doing software testing. That is at least my goal for today. So then lo let's look at one thing I get asked often, which is um, that there are more and more systems nowadays where um, they will automatically detect bugs, like Netflix has a system like this in place, and as soon as they appear, they are automatically rolling back to the previous version. And um, so the question is, does that still make testing necessary? Because if you have a bug, you can always just roll it back. And also here, the short question is, testing is still necessary? Because on the one hand, if users um, experience bug, they <laughs> still experience bugs, and this is bad. Because if users frequently experience bugs, then they will be quite frustrated. And um, also, those systems are like having an airbag in a car. I mean, just because you have an airbag in your car doesn't mean you can drive carelessly, right? It's just a system that is reactive and it can handle cases where maybe some things were not properly tested or were not catched during the development. So you don't want to rely on them alone. 
so to get to my first point that really kind of wastes time is not doing test-driven development. So just to quickly explain it in a nutshell for those of you who don't know what test-driven development is. So first you add a test and then after you added the test you run it and usually it will fail because there's no code yet that will make it pass of course. And then what you do is you make the smallest change possible that you can to make the test pass. Then you run the test. Ideally it passes but it may also fail still which is when you write another small change until the test passes and the test is green and then um, you start over again basically you add another test so instead of starting with the code first you start with the test first so maybe this doesn't seem very intuitive because you may be wondering since when does doing something in a different order save some time actually so as there is just the smallest kind of change that you make to make the test pass, there are less tendencies to over-engineer solutions, which is why less work means you save a lot of time because you don't do over-engineering. And also, um, the code is automatically written to be testable, which is another advantage that you gain of this. And usually, if you have testable code, it also results in good architecture, and um, the thing is also, according to a report, uh, doing test-driven development reduced the percentage of bugs by 80%, which is kind of substantial. And reducing the amount of bugs also, of course, means that you reduce the amount of work that you have to do because you have less time that you need to invest to fix it. So the next one is not following the test pyramid. So who of you doesn't know of the test pyramid already? Okay. Uh, a few people? Okay, that's a good sign at least. <laughs> so let's start from the base. So the test pyramid has three stages. The base one is the unit tests, which are kind of considered um, the most important or those that you should have the most of. And so this also counts for the back end and the front end, which is often forgotten about. So in the front end also you should try to extract m as much logic as possible into functions. Um, if you need to do them in the front end, of course, and then test them in a unit test as well. And also, unit test is only unit test if you have all of the dependencies mocked. This is also something that not all people know about. And um, so the thing is, the principle is you should have the most amount of unit tests. Then the next one is integration tests. And you should have the least amount of end-to-end -end tests. And also in the test pyramid, um, the thing is the tests on the bottom tend to be the fastest to execute and also the most stable, while the ones at the top tend to be the slowest and also the most brittle test. Brittle means that they break often and easily, so just making some small changes result already in things breaking and results are not as reliable, you have more flakiness, what that is we will tackle a bit later. And also the maintenance takes quite a lot of time and is also expensive this way. Um, and stable means that it rarely breaks, time for maintenance is usually quite low, and it's also cheaper, of course. So if you don't believe me that it makes sense to follow this, actually in the bottom left you will see a link to a video that is from Netflix, where they explain that they used to have 100% end-to-end tests, so they didn't have any other tests than end-to-end tests. I hope this shocks some of you, <laughs> at least it does to me. Um, and they changed over to embrace the test pyramid and um, are much happier now. Um, and of course on the right you have a resource to Martin Fowler, the practical test pyramid, which is a good read in my opinion. So now the question is, what does that mean in practice? Let's have a look at an example next. So if we look at an example where we have a um, converter application that converts degrees centigrade to degrees Fahrenheit, now let's look at it from the bottom up. So let's start with the unit tests. So let's say the backend is the one that has the logic implemented that con do does this conversion. Now in this example, let's have a look at what kind of cases could appear. So here, uh, for example, you could do um, boundary value analysis and then you could come up with those kinds of values that you could test in unit tests on the backend, which is what you would do. And then you see here, for example, from minus 274 degrees centigrade, it throws an error because the thing is, you can't have a temperature that is that low, that is below the absolute zero point. 
So here it is an error, and in the other cases, it just returns the expected converted uh, number. And um, so here in this case, just to make it a bit simpler, we are just assuming that whole integers are allowed and not floating point numbers. So uh, now that we have written the unit tests, we write the code to make those tests pass. So we apply test-driven development, just as we learned earlier. And then we go over to write the integration tests. So now I have another question for you. What do you think? How many different cases do we need to test now in, t in, the, in the integration test? So let's see, who of you thinks it th the answer is all of them? So all of the ones we had in the unit tests as well. OK, just one or two hands. That's good. Who of you thinks the answer is two? OK, a few more. Who of you thinks the answer is one? Okay, so the most uh, said two, which is actually the correct amount. <laughs> the thing is, um, you should never test what you have tested before. So for example, the only thing that is different in the integration tests now with the backend API is that, um, you know, assuming that there is a backend API that does this conversion that we use in the front end later, um, we actually have two cases. So one of them is where we, for example, pass as a parameter a number and we check if the value that we get is correct and all of the other parameters are correct. So for example, the response is formed in the right way and so on and the status code. And then the second case is where we just check for this other case where the temperature is too low to see do we get the expected status code and the expected error message, for example, here. Because every other case we would test with a different number would just be, again, a waste of time, <laughs> as it would just test whatever you tested in a unit test already. And then let's go to the final step, so the end-to-end tests. Again, here, this is about not testing what you have tested before. So there are also here two cases. One of them is where you enter, for example, a temperature in, in centigrade, and then you get the temperature in Fahrenheit. And another is where you enter a temperature that is too low and you get an error dialog, which you then assert if the message is correct. And then you click the OK button and expect that the dialog disappears. So now let's look at another time waster, which probably seems very familiar to you. And this is having not enough automation. So executing repetitive tests by hand is quite a waste of time. It's very error prone as well. You have uh, also very limited flexibility in releases. Probably you know this as having things like bug freezes and feature freezes that are necessary so that the testing can catch up because usually it takes quite a lot of time. So um, y this also limits you because you cannot release as often because you have a lot of time that is necessary to invest. And I think the kind of the perfect example here is that, um, you know, the, the scene from the factory from modern times of Charlie Chaplin. Maybe you've seen Charlie Chaplin at the entrance here in the cinema as well. Um, I think that's a perfect example um, for the, these kinds of things. So of what can happen or, uh, <laughs> you know, why we people are not made for this. <laughs> so yeah, maybe some of you know that scene. And then by having automation, you free up time, which enables people to focus on doing more uh, se sensible activities like exploratory test activities that require critical thinking, because critical thinking is a skill that we humans are particularly, p particularly good at. And then there can be also the other way around. You can have too much automation. So the thing is, with, with, any, <laughs> with enough amount of effort, any test case can be automated. But on the other hand, this does not mean that you need to automate anything. So for example, if you have code that only runs once, uh, this usually makes more sense to do it by hand because it's not worth writing code that gets thrown away after it was executed. Then also tests without um, predictable results. So if it's, uh, for example, a system that always behaves a little bit different and you need to have some person that looks at it because it's just not predictable. And also there are things like getters and setters that don't have any logic that you shouldn't test because they are pointless. They don't really test anything. And then one other thing is um, uh, not running tests often enough is also quite a waste of time. So for example, if you 
only run automated tests once a week or for example once a day if you have a failure so it will take more time to find the issue in this case of course this depends on how much development happens if let's say you have 100 merge requests that get merged in a day then already um, having tests run once a day could be very slow and you know after a day have good luck finding out um, where the issue is from those 100 changes that were made so um, the thing is, uh, for direct feedback, I really recommend that you run tests with every pull or merge request, if it's possible, of course. If you don't have the infrastructure to run the tests um, you know, fast enough to make that possible, I recommend that you can consider, for example, running less critical or long-running tests less frequently, maybe, like nightly. But then you, of course, have to live with the consequence that it will take more time to fix uh, issues if they arise um, from tests that fail in the evening, for example. And um, additionally, I still also recommend running nightly tests on the main branch, because then, for example, if at one time um, suddenly there's a browser update and this causes all of the things to break or at least the website not to appear again, you can catch this already quite early this way. And then there's, on the other hand, also the thing of running too many tests. Um, such a thing really exists. So uh, during development and in a pull or merge request, it really makes sense to only run the tests which are impacted by a code change. So this really shortens the development feedback loop. You don't need to wait for 15 minutes every time you have a pull request to see if it uh, works or not. Um, so if you need to wait 15 minutes, this wastes also quite a lot of time. And uh, so by having, let's say, five minute or less um, pull request uh, waiting times for the build, um, you quite sh shorten the development feedback loop by quite a lot. And uh, one example of this is if you have a front end change, then you don't need to run tests in the back end. Yes, there's a question. That is a good question. Uh, I'm coming to this just now. <laughs> so um, the question was, is there a good way to run this in an automated way? So there is actually. So for example, if you are using Jest, there is a toggle that you can enable, which is called changed since, where you can pass a hash. And then it will only run tests that um, were impacted by changes that were made since this commit. And for NX, there is a feature that is called affected, which you can use. These are just two examples, but I'm sure if you Google for this, you will find a lot of um, different ways to do this in the technology that you use uh, to make this possible. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thanks. Um, exactly. And also, here's a link where you can learn more. This is called Test Impact Analysis, where you try to find out, is my test impacted or not? But this is built into a lot of tools today that make this easier for you. Then there are flaky tests. So quickly to explain what flaky tests are. So probably you face them already every time you run a, um, you have a pull request, for example, and then CI runs, and then your tests fail, but locally they passed for you. So then you just click the retry button, of course, and then usually it passes, or if you're unlucky, it fails, and then you run it again, and then maybe it passes. Um, so those tests that sometimes pass and sometimes they don't, so if you run them multiple times and you have different results, um, this is what we call flakiness. So usually doing something over and over again and expecting a different result is called insanity. In software development, we call this flaky tests. <laughs> so yes, so usually if you have flaky tests, this requires rerunning the tests multiple times, which also requires quite a lot of time to invest. And uh, you need to all the time do investigation efforts because flaky tests usually are not flaky like, let's say, once a month, although they could be, which makes it sometimes difficult to find them. But usually they fail like every week or something. So you need to constantly evaluate, is this a real failure or is this just um, a flaky test? And then if you have a lot of flaky tests, then the team starts losing trust in the test results, which is also bad because people are then less likely to maintain the tests or they just ignore failures, you know, which is obviously also bad. One way of mitigating flaky tests um, is 
uh, that you can prevent them from being introduced in the first place, which I would really recommend doing. So um, usually I recommend if you have a pull merge request, then run new or change tests maybe 3, 10 or 50 times, depending on the resources that you have, of course. Or you can just run nightly all of the tests multiple times, even if they pass, not just if they fail. Run them like 3, 10 times and see if they fail, because they should not fail at this point, else they are a flaky test. And then, um, especially if you do it nightly, you should also have a ticket created automatically in a way to for the dev team to fix it, because else, if nobody looks at it, then it's not really worth anything, of course. And then, of course, to, have a, um, to not have flaky tests, you need to have a stable testing environment, which sometimes is easier said than done. But um, ideally, it would be nice if you could spin up the application locally on the build server or something like that to make a more stable um, environment that you can test in. So another one is not doing data-driven testing. So let's see, who of you has never heard of data-driven testing before? OK, so only two or three people. That's also a good sign. So maybe this seems familiar to you. Maybe you've seen it before. I don't know who's seen tests like this before, where it's essentially always the same kind of thing that's tested, just a little thing is changed between each test method. OK, not a lot of people. That's also a good sign. I've unfortunately seen this quite a lot. So the problem, of course, is you have a lot of duplication. This may not seem as crazy here because you just have you know one line, but if the test spans across five lines, um, but unfortunately this doesn't fit on the slide, <laughs> then it would be much worse, of course. And um, if you consider, if you just change one parameter or you just introduce another parameter to the add method, for example, you need to change six tests. And when you create a new case, you need to remember that you changed the content of the case, the display name of the case. You need to come up with some method name that kind of makes sense, which is kind of arbitrary. So it also makes developers usually hesitant to add new cases because it seems uh, annoying to do. And also, it's more difficult to see at a glance what is tested. And usually, it um, takes more space, as you can see here, um, and is more difficult to maintain. And um, yeah, so don't do this. <laughs> then maybe you could say, um, well, you could also write tests like this. Maybe has someone of you seen tests like this? OK, uh, a lot more hands. So that's, uh, so that's something that, that also can be improved. So this is a bit shorter than the other one, of course. But um, the advantage, disadvantage of this one is that if, for example, one of those lines fails, then you will just see that one line that is failing, but you don't know if maybe the others are failing as well. So maybe you're chasing one problem, and then suddenly you run the tests again, and you see that um, there is also another problem that maybe you could have fixed better in the first place. Um, and also, usually, you just get the feedback, let's say, like this. And especially if you run them on CI, and then you see this, and then you have to go into your code, open the add tests class, and then go to line 30, and then you see because otherwise, you know, at first glance, since expected zero appears twice, you don't know which of those, those two lines is now the test that fails. And this is also quite annoying and wastes time. So also don't do this one. So now to show you the way that you should do this. Um, so for JUnit 5, for example, there is a parameterized test option, which I really recommend you use. So uh, there are I will show you today two ways, but um, there are more ways of doing this. One of them is using CSV source, which, as you can see, groups it kind of the, the values into columns. So the first column is A, the second column is B, and the third column is result, which gets kind of injected into the test and ran multiple times. And another advantage of this is um, that you see when you run the test, exactly which tests are run and you see exactly which one has failed so you see here what uh, kind of case it was and you see by using those placeholders in the name it automatically fills in the values for you which makes it very easy to see which tests are failing as well so this is one way i would really recommend using and then there's another one which is at method source uh, this is something you can use if you have especially more complex data types so here you can use parameters that are, for example, whole objects. Um, so with this, you can even test more complex cases. 
Uh, but you can see here, you simply define a different method, and there you can return a stream with some arguments. And basically, it kind of looks similar to the CSV uh, way of doing it before. And also here with at method, at method source, you also get the nice reporting of the test failures as you've seen earlier. Um, if you use Spock, um, I don't know if any one of you uses it. Okay, at least one, that's good. So um, it has data tables, which is also a very nice way of writing this. I feel like it's almost a bit more readable even. Um, you can see those vertical line symbols, which separate the different uh, parameters from each other. The double vertical line symbols, they mean that you separate the parameters from the expected values. And you also get the same nice reporting as you've seen earlier. And then if you're doing tests in Jest, for example, there's also a way of doing this. In Jest, there are actually also multiple ways. This is one of the ways I actually prefer doing it. It's, it's also similar to the data tables that you've seen earlier in Spock. So you can also do it in this way, um, which is essentially the same. You also get the same kind of reporting, which is nice. So then one thing I also see quite a lot is um, wasting time by having quite a lot of logic in the tests. So let's assume we have a database of people and we have a method that is called get people born in, which takes in a city as a parameter and it returns person objects which were born in the city, but um, it returns it from the database, but in, in a random order. So if you write a test and let's assume you want to test if the list contains exactly two people, which are called James Smith and Mary Miller, how would you write a test to verify this? One way to write this could look like this. <laughs> so you don't need to read it all. Um, but you can already see this kind of looks like production code at first. You have a for loop and you have a few ifs. And it's really a nightmare to, uh, to maintain this and to write this in the first place so that you cover all of the different cases. And um, this is bad because having logic could introduce new bugs into the code as well because, um, or could introduce bugs that you don't even notice in this way. And it's also difficult to read, of course. And also, if we just want to verify, let's say, not only two people, but three people, or you suddenly want to verify the middle name as well, it will get much more complicated and out of end here quickly. Also, if suddenly you need to do a null check, then you need to put a null check everywhere, which also makes the code even worse reading. So now you might be saying, well, just use a stream that looks much better. And actually, you are kind of right. It looks much better now. Still, we kind of have the problem that um, we are using logic. I mean, if we are using tests to test streams that we have in code, why should we use them in tests and expect that they work without having a test for them? Um, so here you can see at least it's a bit easier to add, for example, a third case, but then you need to duplicate the code further to the code that we already have duplicated now, additionally to the logic. Um, and also if you add a middle name, it gets even more complicated. So the way you should do it, um, or that I would recommend at least, is using a search A. Who of you knows a search A? Okay, quite a lot of people, that's good. So you can see in a search A, it's just this. So you see it's quite short. So you see, we simply say we take the people list and then we extract the first name and the last name and we check if it only contains exactly these two values and exactly uh, without uh, paying attention to the order. So we are happy because it's easy to read, it's easy to maintain, we don't introduce any bugs this way, which is a good thing. And if we run the tests, we also get good output, which is a big advantage over doing it in any of the other ways I've shown you before. You can see here that um, here it tells you that, for example, here, um, you have an element that is James Smith without the H at the end, but it expected to have an element that says James Smith with an H at the end. So yeah, this really makes it much easier for you to find the issue. Then one thing I see often is kind of misusing behavior-driven development. So also in a nutshell, behavior-driven development is when you specify test scenarios using given when then, um, and there are certain test frameworks like Cucumber, which um, you need to write glue code for. That kind of is a link between the test scenario that you write and the code that you execute to run the tests. And here, really, you need to critically evaluate if the effort that you need to write and maintain the necessary glue code is really worth it. And um, so since it requires 
quite a lot of effort you really need to think about if the advantages that you get from it are worth the effort that you invest into it. So um, there's a quote by the creator of Cucumber that I think is quite good. So um, Cucumber was initially actually created to promote um, collaboration, but often it's not used in this way. Usually it's used, or at least in the cases I've seen so far, in most of those cases it's being used uh, to write automated tests without any input from business analysts. Usually it was, you know, there was a good thought behind it, but it didn't work out in the end. And it just became a tool that made people, um, you know, having tested are more imperative and they lose their documentation value. And they also are slow and brittle as the creator of Cucumber said. And then there's also a quote by a BDD expert, which I think is quite good. So a lot of the BDD cases that you read are written very low level. So for example, you can see when the user enters Smurf into the search text box and so on. So the kind of the right level that you need to reach is something like when the user buys a Smurf, yet this is something that is very rarely done, unfortunately, in, um, in those cases. Another thing I see a lot which is done uh, that wastes a lot of time is having end-to-end -end tests that are inefficient since it's the highest in the test pyramid. It has the most potential to waste time, of course. So. Uh, my first hint is uh, I recommend you to not create test data through the UI. I recommend you to use fixtures which go through, for example, the backend um, API to create test data. And then when you tear the test down, you also delete the test data again through the API, for example. Um, and you set up the data before the test. So that makes the test go a lot quicker. Then you should use deep links to navigate to the page that should be tested instead of navigating to it, then this also makes the tests much more independent because if one of the pages in between break, then you are not stuck. You can si still execute the test and see if the other pages work. And um, then I really recommend you to start the test with the test user already logged in. So really try to already, for example, log in through the backend API and then use that authentication. And also here again to save some time. Of course, unless you're testing the login, then you should use the login page, of course. But otherwise, just um, already keep it logged in. And then try to make it possible to run each test spec independently. This allows you to use parallelization, which makes your tests a lot faster and also saves quite a lot of time as you can only execute small parts of the application um, when you're developing and you can see quite quickly if something fails or not. So I also recommend you not to wait in predefined term time intervals. So probably you have seen in your code somewhere like wait for two seconds or three seconds. You should wait instead for a certain condition to be fulfilled with a certain timeout. This will save you time because let's say you have a two second wait time. Maybe the condition was already fulfilled after 200 milliseconds. Then you're wasting you know, 1.8 seconds of time, which can add up. And uh, also ideally each E3 test spec should not take longer than one minute. This probably seems crazy to a lot of you, I guess. But um, if you don't believe this is possible, uh, feel free to talk to me. I can prove to you that this is possible. Then. Not running tests in parallel is a big point that you can save a lot of time in if you run them in parallel, because this speeds up the time by quite a lot. So um, here, this is more important for integration or end-to-end -end tests. Usually unit tests are quite fast if you really make uh, unit tests. Um, so I recommend you running each end-to-end -end test spec, for example, and browser combination in parallel on the same machine. So optionally across multiple machines, if you have a very, very big application. So uh, there are test frameworks like WebDriver IO, for example, that do this by default, which I think is a very good thing to do. And Cypress, unfortunately, only officially supports it through the cloud and only across multiple machines, which is a bit of a downside um, of that. But uh, in general, still, in my opinion, running tests in parallel is worth it because it makes it possible to have like uh, five minutes, for example, just for the end-to-end -end tests for even a large suite to be run on CI. And uh, also JUnit and other testing frameworks can be configured to run tests in parallel. Um, again, this is mostly relevant for integration tests, not really so much for unit tests. 
And then last but not least, our incomplete test failure reports that um, you know also waste quite a lot of time. So I really recommend you to include as much information as possible, even more than you think you would need. Usually that's a good uh, way of doing it. So um, this really helps you in identifying the issue once the, uh, a test fails, especially if it's a flaky test or if the test fails due to a different system that you have. Then you should include always some detailed request and response data in logs. Of course, this applies mostly to integration and end-to-end -end tests. This really makes it easy if you have a, a different system and you want to see if, for example, the response is the one that caused the test to fail or something like that. And then ideally you should directly attach application logs to test failures, especially if you run tests in CI and it fails there, then it's quite difficult um, because usually the container is gone by the time you want to you know, troubleshoot something. And then having the application logs in the test failure itself makes it quite easy to see what has gone wrong usually. And then in end-to-end -end tests, I also recommend you directly link to any screenshots, videos, and the page source when the failure happened. This way, it also makes it very easy to troubleshoot and you don't need to go to multiple servers and collect it yourself, which also wastes quite a lot of time. Um, this really reduces quite a lot of time you need to investigate the issue. And um, I also recommend you to use some reporting frameworks like Allure which you can see on the right, which make it really easy to see what is wrong and helps you also uh, find the issue, is issue quite quickly. So now I'm at the end of my presentation, but before you can ask questions, I have one last question for you. I would like to know who of you learned at least one new thing today in this talk? Okay, th that's most of you, thanks. That really makes me glad. So now, thanks a lot, and I have some time for some questions. Does someone have a question? Okay, nobody? Ah, there's one, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Uh huh, okay, so the question is, what I think about deleting tests that are very fast and stable, but they are removed to make the tests run faster. Is that what, I'm, what you meant? So usually I'm against that because, uh, you know, you never know. Usually when you delete those tests, especially if you know Murphy's Law, then, you know, like one week later, suddenly you have a bug in this code, which could have been prevented by running the tests. And this is much more expensive to fix. So I would argue that in this case, you know, uh, keeping the tests and running them and maintaining them is probably cheaper than fixing a bug that occurs because of removing the tests in the first place. I think if you have this problem that the tests are running too long, as I mentioned earlier, I would go to measures like, you know, adding parallelization or other things I mentioned earlier. Uh, I would certainly prefer that to <laughs> deleting the tests. Uh, usually that didn't turn out to be a good idea when done in practice. <laughs> yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay, welcome. Any other questions? Yeah. So the question was, um, if you have a unit test, let's say for a class where you have a method called foo, then if you have a test that you write for it, usually maybe you have a naming convention of calling it test foo or foo test. You know, this depends sometimes. The question was, um, doesn't this kind of uh, generate a strong coupling between those two? And if you have a major refactoring that you do, you need to usually invest also some time to mm, clean this up as well. So usually I would argue if you do parameterized tests in the way I've shown you, Sorry, yeah? Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Ah, uh, okay. So the, the question was if there is a class called foo and you have certain methods in it, usually when you write a test it's called foo test and then you have different methods that also are very strongly aligned to the names of the, uh, of the class. And if there's a better way of doing this, um, is that what I've understood correctly? So I have to say I don't know of a better way of doing this, but usually, um, you know, for example, IntelliJ has quite good tools if you rename a class or a method name, if you use the refactoring tools in the IDE. Usually it works quite well so that you don't have many issues when you rename the test, because usually it also uh, asks you if you want to rename the tests as well. And if you do that religiously, let's say like this, it's usually not a big deal. And if you're doing such a major refactoring that you're essentially rewriting the code, probably your tests also need to change quite a bit, at which point probably it makes sense to just create the tests from scratch. I mean, it's very easy to generate them also in most IDEs, um, you know, from a given class, and then just copy paste over parts you had before, and then just modify them slightly. Um, usually, and if you have parameterized tests, then usually this is not as big of a deal. It's usually worse if you have the case where I've shown before, where you have a lot of, uh, you know, single tests for one thing, uh, which makes it even more annoying to do. Um, yeah, sorry that I don't have any better way of doing this, but thanks for the question. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. To ask a question back, um, so you never have in your application cases where you actually have logic in it? You only call external dependencies, for example? You never... My own yeah, are your own services, but... Yeah. But uh, so the thing is, but at, at some point you have the logic in some service somewhere where you have a unit test, right? For that, that would be, of course, the case. So the, the question is to to put it, I think, um, if you have, let's say, a lot of code which calls other code or that you have a lot of dependencies in it, or you call just mostly other services, but you don't really do any logic yourself, um, if it really is worth writing unit tests for that and not just writing solely integration tests for that, is that what I said correctly? Okay. So I, I say it, it depends on the case, of course. This is something to look at um, case by case, I think. I mean. I think if you just have uh, one service that is delegating to a different service, it's not worth testing this in integration test, in my opinion. Unless, of course, you are doing some mapping, for example, of data, or you are kind of, I don't know, pulling together multiple sources and then sourcing the data from there and passing it into the other method. I think maybe it could be worth it to add a test uh, at this point for the unit test. And also, um, I think you mentioned that it takes about the same time to run or the same type of uh, same amount of repeatability than writing unit tests but it's simply you know it takes more time to write right that's Yeah, so the thing is, um, the disadvantage of integration tests is that on the one hand it takes more time to execute, of course, which is also another disadvantage. And also, if just, let's say, one of your dependencies is down, then, you know, your tests are suddenly not as accurate anymore. We're having a, 
um, you know, a unit test would be beneficial in this case. So you really need to weigh the different options. This is kind of a difficult case to judge. I mean, as I mentioned, if you have just a delegating call or you just call the repository and add some object that is passed in verbatim, probably it's not worth writing unit test for that. Um, but otherwise, I would argue that usually it's still worth it to do it, but um, it really depends on the case. I think there are certain cases where it doesn't make sense to write a unit test, as I've said before. But um, in a lot of cases it is, or at least what I've noticed is, if you don't start writing one, then if someone adds something to that class, they are much less likely to, at that point, you know, create a unit test, even if it would make sense at that point. <laughs> so that's why usually even in, in those cases where sometimes it may not make the most sense, just because maybe I'm anticipating that something may change in the future, um, I may still add a test just because it usually doesn't take that much time to write, um, if you're experienced at it, of course. And um, the next developer that touches this code is much more likely if they introduce logic to add it. If you mention it in a pull request, they usually get mad in my experience. So <laughs> yeah, no, that's just my experience. Yeah, sorry? So the question is about tips about mocking. So uh, essentially, I would, if I would definitely use Mokito. I mean, uh, for Java, for example, which works very well. Um, maybe, you know, there are a lot of nice tools that Mokito has. Maybe watch a talk or two about them, you know, to really get to know Mokito, how to use it, because um, if you know how to use it very efficiently, it's quite nice. And if you, for example, use Spring or something, you can use like mocked beans and uh, annotations, which also makes it quite easy. Or there are features in uh, Mokito where, for example, you can have just um, where you can just put the at mock annotation in front of fields and it will automatically mock them for you. You don't even need to initialize them and things like this. And um, there are also features where like the lenient, um, I forgot the, the second word after that, but there's a lenient mode in Mokito where um, it will automatically add the assertions for you as well, which is also very nice and saves up some time. Of course, this depends on the different technologies that you use. But um, I think knowing the tools usually and um, you know knowing them in detail makes it quite easy at least. Or maybe if you have a really big application, build abstractions around them, like you know, like a base test class that you extend that already includes some base mocks that you use often or things like this. Mm? Yeah, there was one more question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I understood the, correct, uh, the, the question correctly, it was about that you have um, a company where, um, which a contract which does end-to-end -end tests for you, right? And they... Okay, so they are... Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is, how can you convince a company that uh, that only does end-to-end -end tests? Why doing, you know, following the test permit with the unit tests and so on makes sense? Is that the correct way? 
actually, I would send them the video from Netflix that I linked because I feel like this is very convincing if you hear their story because Netflix has a huge code base and hearing how much they struggled with this, you know, this kind of, you can show them that to them and then tell them, you know, as soon as you grow, this will be you one day. <laughs> and then you will make the same experiences and you will, um, you know, the Netflix also in the video mentions exactly, you know, like how much time it took them and, you know, how much time they wasted. I feel like hearing a case study or like a st story of uh, a real case that happened is quite convincing in a way. But also, you know, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, like with the testing perimeter, it just takes much less time to execute and find the bugs and so on. And this is really proven also. Um, you can also read the practical test permit by Martin Fowler and then maybe or sh send it to them or, you know, maybe that helps it convince them or maybe you can just talk to them in, you know, uh, in easier words. Um, yeah. Does that help you? Yeah, definitely have a look because I feel like the video would uh, help a lot <laughs> in this case, yeah. All right, is that your answer, answer, answer this way? Okay, any other questions? I think I saw one more. Ah, yeah, sorry. So do I understand that correctly that it's mostly uh, the issues mostly arise with tests that are of external su software supplied by external suppliers. It's m not really about the software that they build themselves or. Okay, I see. So the it's more the compliance is a bigger point for them, or that's the most important point to them, and they don't really care about anything else. Yeah. Ah, okay, I see. Well, I mean, uh, so the question <laughs> it's it's a bit difficult to rephrase this, but in a way, it's a company where uh, the only thing that really counts is to have um, really just uh, tests that test compliance because. Uh, uh, you know, communicating between different suppliers is the most uh, important uh, thing to check in a way. 
And uh, it's maybe difficult to convince them that writing unit tests is maybe a good idea to do. Um, and uh, this is kind of a difficult case. I mean, um, maybe one thing to mention could be that they could, um, you know, if this is if they really have no logic at all that they need to test, and that's the only thing that they need to make sure of, or that you know, if that really works for them this way, <laughs> maybe it could be not too bad doing it this way. I mean, <laughs> but if they have logic and they uh, frequently experience bugs because of that logic not being tested, uh, I mean, for sure that would be one point to mention, right? I mean, if you would notice that often there are bugs that are difficult, for example, to find because you s just see an end-to-end -end test failing or, for example, uh, there are a lot of flaky end-to-end -end tests that are very difficult to solve, maybe you could also try it from that angle to sell it, uh, to say, like, if you have more unit tests, then maybe you have less issues with flakiness because... Um, you know, you most take most of the cases you test at the unit test level. I don't know, does that help maybe? <laughs> maybe, sorry? Yeah, maybe else you can come afterwards and we uh, can have a chat um, further to see. Are there any other questions? Yeah? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mhm. 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 Exactly. Exactly. So the yeah. Yeah. Mhm. So the question was if there is some flakiness um, and you don't get time to fix it, how do you do it? Because, you know, if you don't get the time, uh, then, <laughs> you know, you cannot fix them and this will make the people ignore the tests and then they will probably never remove it and so on. Did I understand that correctly? So the thing is, I experienced this actually myself in uh, at least one project that just comes to my mind. Um, so I would first try to talk to the, I don't know, to the depending on project structure, of course, to the PO or, you know, to the management and try to convince them that, um, you know, that you need to invest continuous efforts into, uh, you know, every time a test fails to see if it is a legitimate failure or whether it's a flaky test. Um, maybe explain flaky test in a bit, you know, easier words for them, of course. Um, and then um, if they don't really listen to you, what I would do personally is I would, uh, every time I there is a flaky test, I would take it up on me. And then I would write down how much time I need to do this. And then I would do this for, let's say, a month. Then I would go to the management and tell them, look here, is the number of time I wasted this month to, um, you know, to always investigate those uh, failures. And um, if I would invest this time into fixing the, uh, the test, then um, I would save this amount of time every following month. And then suddenly they start to understand because some managers just understand numbers, which I, I, I guess that would probably work. <laughs> Does that help you? <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, another question? So the question was if there are any good tools that you can use to manage uh, flaky tests or that you can have them marked, for example, or that you can automatically have them rerun and so on. Is that your question? So uh, to have them marked and so on, for example, Allure does this. So if you have Allure set up um, to get a report from this, uh, it marks you tests that are flaky so that it, it recognizes it based on you know, previous test runs if they failed and it will mark them. Um, there are other tools like Cypress, if you pay for it, they also have like a flaky detection thing uh, going on. Um, of course, um, the implementing the mechanisms I mentioned earlier, like that you retry a test like three or five times or so and so on. You can on the one hand do this via annotations on the tests themselves. Um, or there are certain specialized tools that do this. One example is Bezel from Google which is a build tool and it has integrated mechanisms where you can define things like this that are done automatically. You know, so for example, new code automatically gets run, you know, as many times in the tests and to make sure that they're not flaky and so on. Google had especially a lot of problems with flaky tests before in the past and that's why they kind of introduced the system. Um, you know, apart from that, the solutions would be quite individual depending on the technology and the tests uh, where this occurs, but maybe that helps you. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions? 
Okay, so I'm already quite a lot over my time. Um, I thank you a lot for your attention. I hope it wasn't too long or uh, too boring. Um, and also thanks a lot to organizers of JCon. It's you're doing really a great job and everyone that helps. Uh, thanks a lot.